Hello and welcome. This is our first lecture for our 3.30 and 4.30. Um, today we're going to introduce the idea of composition. So um, just as a, something to fill up the white space here, this is our week one. It's our first lecture. Today we're talking a lot about what is in the uh, module described as form function, but uh, you could otherwise just say it's um, you know, getting the idea of the big structures. How do we introduce an idea visually and make sure that our viewers understand that message? So what we'll be doing is uh, going through some, some imagery. Uh, we'll be looking at some images on PowerPoint specifically. And then towards the end, we're going to start to take a look at um, some actual examples and then how I'd like to see you start to work into these uh, exercises to try to develop the same style of uh, analysis. So think of this as kind of an introduction. I'm going to throw a lot of stuff at you. Um, some of it you might be familiar with, some maybe not so much, but I have to give you the whole thing just to help you to see all the different tools that you have at your disposal. And then as we go through the class, what we'll be doing is isolating um, a week on just one style or tool for composing. But this is really kind of like the whole, uh, the whole big picture. So this is a slide that more or less gives you some context as to how old the ideas that we're using in terms of composition are, uh, and that you know from Plato to um, you know Rene Huy more currently, that it's really just a discussion of unity and diversity, right? That you want a composition that is unified, right? That shows some kind of comprehensive idea. And Plato would have thought that this is uh, kind of the imperative for the artist is to um, organize something that's uniform or comprehensive out of all of the variety that's available. Um, but if you've seen images that are just totally unified with no variety, they're kind of boring. They're just, uh, you know, like a square, a gray square can unify a field. It doesn't necessarily mean it's interesting. Or like, um, you know, it could also be described as monotonous, as it is in, in the paragraph there. So in order to create some visual interest in, in unity, diversity is a complementary and needed, or variety is a complementary and, and needed um, tool for a unified composition. So those two things in this class are things that we want to have in equilibrium. Uh, it's a good way to start thinking about pictures doesn't mean you always have to do anything, right? A lot of this is going to also be subjective. You all have your own style, I'm sure, your own ideas that you want to organize and communicate, and you all have different visual interests. So what I'm giving you, or I hope to give you in this class, is something general that regardless of your style or how you come to a picture or how you appreciate art, that you can still take all of this structured way of analyzing and thinking and just fit your own interests into it. So what is composition? What is it that we're trying to do? What is this class built around? Um, composition is just another way of saying that you have a plan, right? You're, it's a visual plan. You're trying to organize all these weird things that we have in the arts, which are only four, right? But you know you can use them in, in different ways. So if we think of organizing in abstract elements, what are those in art? Well, line, right? Um, value, color, and shape, right? Those are your ABCs. If you were writing, or you're writing a letter, you in writing you're doing the same thing, right? You're you have a, a variety of things that you could say endless possibilities, and you have the alphabet, and different alphabets, and different ways of making words, and then you unify that information with some kind of concept, or some type of intention. So art's the same. I want you to think of it like a language, right? There's, there's a lot of right, leeway in language. There's some rules, but they're often broken. But the goal of speaking, or communicating, is to share a message. Right, is to, to communicate something. So this is a way to kind of very generally define composition. It's a visual plan where we organize these abstract elements of which we have four which we work with, and that's organized towards some kind of goal. 
the hard part is sometimes in uh, figuring out what that goal is. The other thing that might you know help if you're feeling a little overwhelmed so far is not everybody uses all of these. Like you know some artists just use shape. And we're going to talk about um, up. So just shape, shape in some line or shape in some texture. So this is you know some of you if you're worried about style. Style might be how you end up choosing which of these that you gravitate towards and which you don't. So we could say this is eventually where you're going to come across your own style, but that comes later. Okay, so if we've arrived at this definition, what's our goal? And that takes us to the next thing. What do you want to say? That's not for me to answer, by the way, right? So that's, that's on you. You're the artist. You're the illustrator, you're the fine artist, you're the concept artist, if it's entertainment. Uh, it's your responsibility to communicate something. And that something could be a feeling, it could be an idea that you have, it could be uh, sharing of an experience. But to have content implies that there's some kind of subject or story or information that an audience needs and that your artwork is the conduit for that. So you can't have a composition without something to say. You have to have content, right? It's, it's an important aspect to putting out a message. The other is, the other necessary component, so if we say these are two things that you need in order to have composition, uh, is form, right? And you, know, you, you hear me say, like, um, you know, the title of this module is form function or content form, right? These are things that are always paired together. So form we could de describe as, how do I communicate that message with those weird abstract principles? Or right? what is the pictorial equivalent of whatever it is that I wanna say? How do I create the experience of a feeling with line, value, color, and shape? Because I can't write it. We're not in a literature program. We're not writing stories. You're not in this class. Some of you might be communicating a story with an image, but this is purely visual. So in order to create a composition, we have to know what our content is. And then two, we have to be able to communicate that content with line, value, color, and shape. So here's a couple examples. This is Raymond Lowy's design, the bottom left, for the Greyhound bus. Right? I think it's a great example of a successful resolution of content and form and then an unsuccessful one and you know if we were all in class together I would ask you what you think of the top and the bottom and which one is more appropriate for for Greyhound um, but we could we could tackle it this way too so here's a way to illustrate some of the things we've just been talking about so let's say if we just kind of fill in some of these gra these um, gaps I'm making a composition for Greyhound bus if I'm Raymond Lowy who is a, a really famous designer. So Greyhound wants this. What is the content of Greyhound's message? Uh, what kind of, so this is, you know, something that ad agencies would work a lot on. What is the, the feeling that you want to experience? Well, let's say, like, if it's taking the bus, public transportation, you want it to feel like there's an ease to it, or that maybe it would be fast, or that it would be efficient, right, or, or something like that. So in a composition, it could be useful to just use one word or two words, or one thing that you're looking to get across. And if we look at this one, we could say, well, that, that really doesn't feel like either of those things. And then the next question is, well, why? Why doesn't it feel like that? And then we would shift into an analysis of form. Well, what kind of abstract qualities are here in this design for the, the dog? Um, their shape and there's value, okay, that's all. So what's the value? Oh, it's pure black. Well, that's good because this is really gonna pop. You know, it's gonna read well if it's on any type of surface. So good, yeah, check. What about shape? Well, if I just look at the shape, there's a lot of straights in this shape, right? And then the shape itself is kind of thick and there's areas where there's symmetry in the shape, right? And all of these qualities make this feel slow and kind of heavy. Uh, so no, that's the wrong form content relationship. 
because I don't get to the feeling that I want to communicate. So if I go back to my composition, I have the plan, I have my abstract elements, but the goal wasn't reached. So what's better? Well, this is the one they end up using. So shape and value are still the things being used here. Value is still a dark black or a value 10. But now we have a different design in the shape. We have different planning of the shape. The shape here, instead of using straights, right, there's no straights. It's only curves and C's and S. So there's asymmetries. Right? So this feels more like movement. And that's um, one of the design principles that we'll cover is just the idea of movement. And an easy way to create that is with asymmetries it, uh, or offset curves. It creates a series of movements and rhythms for the eye. It's also thinner. There's not as much mass here. So it feels sleek or fast, easy, maybe even elegant, which are things that I want a consumer to associate um, in my business, or in this case, in the Greyhound bus business or public transport business. So that would work. That would be a successful composition from the stand standpoint of combining content and form. So that's what, at base, what we're looking to do in this class. Can you articulate an idea? You know, and in, in the initial projects, I'll be assigning you that idea so you don't have that burden. Towards the end of the class, it will be your responsibility to define that. And then can you arrive at a series of planned abstract elements to communicate that idea? But this is everything. There's nothing that you look at visually that doesn't have this thinking behind it. Uh, if we look at another example, like a radically different example, this is the art of up, or it's taken from the art of up. So around 2005, um, six, this is uh, by the designers, the concept designers of the, the movie started out with what's called a form language, right? And that is what's over here, right? These, this lineup. Uh, and this is really common for animation. Every movie has a form language. Uh, and it's usually based around the characters. And it's always based on archetypes, which are uh, kind of psychological responses to shape. And if you look at each one of these characters, you can see how they're all related to a very simple shape. Right? So there's, there's a square, and that's clearly this, the old man. And the reason that this is uh, effective is because he carries all the attributes psychologically that we associate with a square. Slow, stubborn, static. In some cases, it might be strong, right, if it's a larger character. And if you read the, the art of Up, they design this uh, with a name. It's called Simplexity. So even in their... Uh, mapping or planning. They've given new names to the form language they want, which is, and they define it as, um, arriving at the simplest means to arouse the most complex emotional response in their audience. And so all work being done prior to anything being colored or rendered. This is like the, the skeletal structure of the idea. Uh, we might look at, you know, the boy as this kind of rounded shape and everything with him is is curved and rounded and the tension in the movie is really between those two things right it's the future and the past right because spheres always represent the future cyclical um, like they're almost always used all also in political paintings or religious paintings around the head of a saint or Christ, or if it's a political painting, that the shape of the king in the torso and the head is almost always circular to associate a feeling of continuity. Uh, and story right, is born of tension. So the stubborn old man in contrast or in tension with the future uh, kind of represented through the boy is the tension of the story. 
And then there's a lot of other familiar archetypes if you studied animation here, like the bottom heavy shape, right? Or the sidekick shape. But this is just a way to give that same observation of how content and form, right, is what's needed in terms of a pairing for every single visual piece that we respond to. So here's just another um, example so that you can see that in a little bit more detail. Again, I talked about this a little bit on the last slide, uh, but this is just so you, you know I'm not lying. So it's, it was named Simplexity, the art of simplifying an image down to its essence, selective detail, and then you can see here how in that thinking, every shape is a symbol. Every shape means something. Circle means the future, square means the past, and that the contest between those two is a lot of the tension. And you can see that even in like the secondary features, like as a whole, he's a box, but his head is a box. His glasses are a box. His shirt is a box, right? His buckle is a box. So a lot of the times, all of those forms are repeated. Um, specifically, if you're interested in character design, character design is always 60, 30, 10. For, and I'm talking mostly about kind of, um, what are they called? Like big budget movies or in games, like A, A games or whatever the, the phrasing is for the, the popular games. And this is almost always described as whatever is dominant. So in him, you know, it's, clearly boxes, that's his dominant psychology that's communicated. 30% might be, there's some areas of sphere, right? Like his nose is a sphere. He has these on his, the bottom of his hurricane, whatever, um, hurricane cane, it has spheres as well. And that might break it up by giving some variety. And then 10% is always like secret ingredient. It's something to kind of spice it up. Uh, and so like maybe there's triangle in him, like 10% of him might be that there's some triangular shapes as if we start to look really closely like his bow tie or his jaw, uh, like the furrows off his nose. Right? So it's, it's always unity. What's the, so kind of just to use this unity. I'm unifying the idea of this character as someone that is stubborn, that's unified because the majority of this image is rectangles, but I need something that gives a little variety or diversity to it to break it up. And I'm choosing to use spheres. And that gives him a little bit of, kind of sets off the boxes by allowing some areas of um, fluidity. And then the very bottom, I'm breaking up those even further with a little bit more in terms of adding some triangles. So it's still unity and variety, just like, um, the Greyhound bus was the same. I'm unifying this shape and bringing variety into the rhythms of the interior. So here's some basic questions that you should ask yourself every time you're looking at an image. We're starting out this semester by analyzing other people's pictures, or character designs, or illustrations. You're learning based on what you like. So I don't care what you choose. I'll give you some paintings. I'll give you some imagery so that you can have an opportunity to you know, look at some that maybe I think are a good challenge. But you always get to look at what you want to learn from in this class. right? How you want to define your style is going to be a lot about what you look at and how well you understand it. So you could use this list for yourself or as you look at someone else's work. So you could say, if you're starting to look at something, what is your idea? Or you could say, what is their idea? What is the, the imagery? What, what do I think the idea is? What is meant to be said? What do I want to say? Either one. You're basically here just trying to figure out what the content is on your behalf or on someone else's. So what is the content? Two, what formal elements are being used? Right? So these are the abstract elements that we talked about. Remember, you only have four. That's all that we have at our disposal in art. We just have those four things. So I'm always interested in how does content 
how is content relayed through those? And I think people, when they look at paintings or pictures, always have a, it's really easy to overlook this because people connect with, oh, the person is looking this way, or this is a picture about two people standing somewhere, but it's not because you're all artists. You know that imagery is made from the inside out and that often what is organizing and telling you a story isn't exactly what you see on the outside. Right? And this will become, it probably sounds bizarre, but it'll become more and more clear. From these four, you only have six possible effects, right? So you can use line, shape, tone, or color to create rhythm, emphasis, economy, repetition, balance, or movement. That's it. These are design principles, right? And that's most what people are looking for or designing with. So even though it seems like we're getting, there's a lot here, at least it's limited, right? This is what people are working with. This is how people compose, right? So it's, as long as you can understand what's here over the course of the semester, um, you're gonna have a really solid idea and practice of composition. And then I start you know, designing my own image or understanding someone else's by looking at how the frame is used. Right, so all of this, that this is to say that all of this doesn't just exist in a floating space. Everything visual is framed by some type of shape. You know, think of billboards, think of movie screens, think of your phone, think of advertisements that you see. Everything is occurring within some kind of border. So one of the most important things after we understand what it is that we want to say and the means available to us for saying that is how do we put it inside of a frame? You know, frames don't have to be this. It could also be this. Sometimes in history, frames have been circular, um, but that's it, right? To say this in a different way, you know, if we want to look more specifically now at trying to create unity and variety, I think of unity as what ties the whole thing together. Or you wanna make that a little bit more complicated or say it in a more complicated way. Unity ties the abstract, okay, so these are the abstract. These are abstract things. Line, shape, color, value are abstract things. And psychological. So psychological is the content, it's the message. So for example, I'll give you a, a simple example down here. The history of religious paintings is always a frame like this, and then it's unified with one shape, triangle. And that triangle is always perfectly symmetrical. So this is a unifying idea. Triangles are powerful because they're stable. When they're organized in the frame with symmetry, they become even more stable because now the frame is equalized on each side. So it feels even more static, immobile. This is always paired with religious paintings because it communicates an idea of power, stability, right? So you'd always have like um, maybe Mary, in Christ or the shepherds or Joseph and baby Jesus somewhere in the middle or towards the bottom. But this is a powerful and static way to create through abstract means, the psychology that people associate with religion. Okay, so if we say that's unifying, so I've unified an idea about how I wanna show people a religious picture, variety, would be varying within that shape to create support or tension. And this is a really important thing here. So affinity or contrast. These two things can work together. That would be support. So let's say I wanna use variety to further unify that picture, right, this religious one. I could use color, or maybe I use color that's harmonious so that it maintains a feeling of symmetry, 
or maintains a feeling that doesn't upset what I've done with this first step here. But you could also create contrast. Right? I could create a variety that maybe has a figure in the background moving this way, right? or a shape kind of going off that direction. And if I use a lot of contrast back here, like a lot of darker value, it's going to take my eye away from how it's organized in the center there, right? or from what is the unifying principle of the composition. This creates tension. Right? It, creates a competing area of visual interest in the frame. And don't worry, I know this is a bizarre looking picture, so I'm going to show you some examples. But again, like I tried to introduce this, these are all big ideas, big working processes, big definitions. I put this slide in so that you could have clear definitions that you could revisit for all of these things. Um, so if we just take a you know quick uh, moment to define them. So one, and then we'll take a, a short rest after this, or I'll give you a break. So what is unity? So I'll define it as a linear, geometric, or any other formal device in a frame that lays out the subject, theme, or concept. So the example I used prior was triangle equals religion when it's symmetrical in a composition. That would be a way to unify something. What is rhythm? Rhythm is the placement and relationship of elements within a piece. What we usually look for with rhythm is to create a feeling of motion between those elements. So rhythm could be fast or slow. Emphasis. This is a really important one because if you can find an area of emphasis, it's usually going to tell you what's unifying the composition. Emphasis is usually associated with a, uh, a primary focal point. So it's a, a primary emphasis, usually where the main contrast exists. And there can be multiple areas of emphasis in a composition. What is variety? Something that we've talked about a little bit. It's a quality of variation. That's it. It's to break up unity, to give it some interest, diversity. And it could really include anything. It could You could have a variety of subject matter or shapes or values or edges. Um, like variety was in the art of up because you have this and you have this and you have this and then you have the opposite. So you have that, right? That's variety. It's an irregularity of shape that creates a more interesting uh, experience of the of the total, right? Because the art of up would be way probably would be way less successful if every character was just this, and then inside the boxes the features were rendered really well for each character, right? That would be totally unified and totally boring. Economy is the use of complex versus simple elements. So think of this in terms of pacing, maybe. Uh, you can have dense or passive. So it has a lot to do with pacing, uh, allowing the eye some rest. Repetition, similar to rhythm, but anytime anything is repeated in a composition two or more times, so you have the same shape repeated, you have the same color repeated, it allows a relationship to take place of repetition. So our eyes are always drawn to things that are repeated. One of the ways we experience a composition is by organizing like things, right, in a picture. So repetition can be a powerful visual tool to help you move your viewer's eye around or recognize things that are important to you. Balance is visual weight how we think of a picture frame being weighted. Uh, we'll do a lecture on this, but an easy way to think about it is just symmetry and asymmetry. Symmetry is balanced, asymmetry is not. Not in, the, not in the same kind of clean way. Movement and continuity is a formal engagement with the eye. It's how you move your viewer's eye through your different reads. And if all of these things are used 
and understood, or even if some of them are used, right, to, to organize an image, you will get a clarity of purpose. Your viewer will understand, right, the content or the subject matter if you've all kind of, if you've aimed all of these things toward your form function relationships or form content relationships. So what we'll be doing in this class is you know, these kind of setup lectures to start, and then each one of these will get its own lecture. That way you can understand kind of each one in isolation. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, in case anybody's still unclear, there's a few more descriptions. Uh, I'm just going to do this one, and then and then that'll all I'll give you guys a break. Um, so what is Unity? It's the presentation of an integrated image, right? So all of the parts are kind of organized. Everything looks like it goes together. Nothing's kind of floating on the outside of the page. But it's also very similar to um, the idea of a gestalt. It's that we see the whole effect of something. We have an understanding of the whole as soon as we see it. And it's important because we kind of, as viewers, instinctively want this. Okay, uh, this is where we're going to pick back up. I'm going to end the video here, though, just so you don't have to sit through really long videos every time you sit down to watch. Um, so take a short rest, you know, maybe take a chance to look over your notes, think about if there's anything that maybe didn't sit with you, write down a question if you haven't, and we can address it when we meet live. Um, and then, you know, take, take the next step, and we'll talk, start talking about actual ways that some of the things I described are used in, in imagery today.